Hi everyone, welcome to the USGS Landslide Hazards Seminar. I'm Stephen Slaughter and this meeting is hosted by the Landslide Hazards Program and co-organized co with contributions from Matt Thomas and James Kosnick. Uh, following the presentation, you have the ability to submit questions via the chat window or use the raise your hand feature in combination with their microphone and video camera. We typically wait until the end of the presentation to take questions. Uh, during the presentation, please keep your microphone and cameras turned off. Today is going to be another installment of our mini series where we hear from state surveys. These talks provide an overview of the state landslide expertise, focus areas, uh, product types, and introduce landslide related problems of the state. We'd like to have your state landslides work uh, spotlighted in part as part of this series. Please contact one of our co-organizers. So today we're going to be joined by Deanne Stevens, chief of the sorry, chief of the engineering geology section at the Alaska Division of Geological and Geophysical Surveys, or DGGS. As chief, Deanne provides administrative, supervisory, and technical leadership for DGGS's surficial geology, geo geohazards, construction materials resources programs, or sorry, and construction materials resources programs. So that's a mouthful. Her main research focus areas are surficial geologic mapping, quaternary studies, permafrost and paraglacial processes, uh, geohazards, construction material resources, tephra chronology, and the use of satellite remote sensing for geologic applications. Uh, Deanne started at DGGS in 1991 after earning her ge uh, graduate degrees in geology and remote sensing from University of Alaska Fairbanks and University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. She earned her undergraduate from Whitman College in Washington State. Welcome Deanne, and the virtual stage is yours. All right, thank you very much, Stephen. I appreciate that. And thank you everybody for uh, joining me for a uh, brief visit to the state of Alaska and landslide issues that we're dealing with here. So let me go ahead and make sure this is working. All right, where am I coming to you from? Well, I'm with the Alaska Division of Geological and Geophysical Surveys. We're a state government agency, uh, part of the Alaska Department of Natural Resources. So we are not affiliated with the university like some geological surveys are, although we do have some close partnerships with uh, university researchers. Currently, and I say currently because we are in a state of flux, we have been growing a lot and we also have staff coming in and out who are non-permanent or interns, but currently we have about 63 employees of which uh, 46 are scientific and technical staff. And we have offices located in Fairbanks and in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, we're organized into uh, content area specialties uh, sections, uh, which include engineering geology, which is the group that I head. Um, our state geological survey was established by state statute. And as part of that state statute, uh, we include geologic hazards. So um, what we're doing is what we're supposed to be doing. Um, if you want to get more information about DGGS and what we're up to, uh, visit us uh, on the web at www.dggs.alaska.gov. All sorts of wonderful things to look at there. But let's move on and let me tell you about Alaska and the situation that we're dealing with in Alaska. Um, Alaska is big, complicated, and different. And this graphic here is a favorite amongst all Alaskans to show just how big Alaska actually is compared to the conterminous United States. Um, bit of trivia for you. Um, you might know Alaska has the farthest north point in the United States and the farthest west point in the United States, but we also have the farthest east point in the United States because our Aleutian Islands extend out beyond the 180th meridian. So we have a lot of most in Alaska. And uh, as you can expect, this size and this geographic extent make things very challenging. Here's another look at this idea of being, being big to kind of put it into perspective because we can talk about miles and whatnot, but here let's compare us to the sizes of some other states and keep that in perspective too as we're talking about uh, trying to understand landslides and other geology in Alaska and comparing us to what other states have to contend with. So uh, thanks to Brian Brett Schneider for putting these graphics together, uh, very useful. Find your state and see how you rate against Alaska. We have 571,000 square miles of terrain to deal with. Not only are we big, but we're complicated. This is the uh, very simplified geologic map for the state of Alaska put together by the U.S. Geological Survey. And when I say simplified, I mean simplified. Uh, this is actually two map sheets put together that make up a big bed sheet. And 
even at that size, it's compiled at a scale of one to 1.6 million. Um, this map focuses on the, uh, the bedrock geology, but you can see a whole swath of light yellow, which is all the unconsolidated deposits. And one thing that I do want to point out to you is, you know, overprinted on this complex bedrock geology, we have um, extreme Pleistocene glaciation and the, uh, the consequences of that on the landscape. And uh, if you can see my pointer, the area here of the Brooks Range, all of this northern mountainous terrain was completely covered by ice. And then here in the southeast, up through the lower central part of the state, and then on out to the Aleutians, was also thickly, thickly buried by glacial ice in the Pleistocene. So we have complex geology and we have big glaciers. Um, of which we still have glaciers that are retreating, and that geology and that glaciation has a strong impact on what our slope stability hazards are. Um, we have not been very well geologically mapped. Um, the entire state has not been mapped, even at one to quarter million scale. Um, and the degree of mapping becomes increasingly less as the scale increases, and the more zoomed in you get, the less mapping there is. Um, I know a lot of states have statewide LIDAR, and in fact, they have repeat LIDAR acquisitions. Statewide LIDAR in Alaska, I have HA as it being a joke with our size being what it is. Um, the national three depth standard for Alaska, instead of the LIDAR of the lower 48 states, is five meter IFSAR. So um, very detailed elevation data is very lacking. Um, for the longest time, we didn't have very good statewide high resolution imagery either. However, in the last few years, that has been getting a lot better. And I believe now we have a, a fairly well integrated um, 0.5 meter um, imagery data base, base layer that we, we can work from. So we're complicated with geology, lots going on there. We're not very well mapped. Um, I pull this diagram or, or the, this figure here for two reasons. Um, it's important for two reasons. One is because um, you can see on the left, which shows earthquake epicenters in just one year, in 2014 in Alaska, you can see the multitudinous epicenters that we have. And yet on the right, you see what is currently known about the quaternary faulting and folding in Alaska. And it's pretty darn sparse when you start comparing it to the seismicity of just that one year. So this kind of shows or highlights the lack of data, field data and mapping that we have in Alaska. But it also highlights the high level of seismicity that we have in Alaska and keep that in mind as we start talking about landslide hazards. Um, we also have complexity being big and across uh, many uh, extending north and south and east and west very far. We have eco regions that extend into the Arctic and subarctic and all the way to temperate coastal. So we've got just about everything in the bag. We have, um, we may recognize these physiographic divisions from the lower 48 from North America. We have extensions of the Rocky Mountain and Pacific Mountain systems, as well as the intermontane plateaus and interior plains. So a lot of variability there going on in terrain. We have extremes of precipitation and temperature. Um, mean annual precipitation ranges from about four inches in a year in Barrow up to about 196 inches a year in Whittier down in uh, southern, uh, just a little bit east of Anchorage on that map. Um, Mean annual temperatures also extreme. Um, I'm sorry, I'm mixing uh, mixing my units here, but the mean annual temperatures in degrees Celsius. Um, but for record temperatures in Alaska, they range from Prospect Creek Camp by the Alaska Canada border at minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit at Fort Yukon. And so all of these extremes. Um, they affect the physical processes like acting upon the landscape. And you'll see uh, aspects of that as we look at landslides. And uh, in particular, us being so far north and us being so far cold, um, we deal with permafrost in a way that uh, maybe the other states don't have to deal with. And so this is a permafrost distribution map for 2008. It's a version of something um, with climate changing the way it is. 
uh, permafrost distribution has become a moving target. Back when I first started working at State Geological Survey back 30 years ago, there was a permafrost map of Alaska, and that was kind of the map of permafrost in Alaska. And these things aren't, aren't as, uh, as accurate as they used to be because things are changing. Now, permafrost itself, you need to, to understand what that means. That means that this is ground that stays at or below freezing for at least two years, two years in a row minimum. So it's continuously frozen ground. So the permafrost distribution kind of shows those temperature relationships with um, percentage of the ground that is in that permanently frozen state. So continuous permafrost means more than 90% of the um, subsurface ground surface, if you look at things aerially, 90% of what you're looking at is underlain by frozen ground, perennially frozen ground. Um, and you can imagine that as soil temperatures change, that those um, permafrost characteristics are going to change and those boundaries are going to change. And that clearly is going to have an impact on slope stability. There's a second factor we need to take into account, and that's a ground ice volume, because permafrost itself only speaks to a state of temperature. It does not speak to what that material is that's frozen, because you can have solid rock that's permafrost, and it doesn't matter if that heats up, it's going to still be solid rock. But when you start getting different kinds of materials and different amounts of actual frozen water ice in there, um, then you start dealing with some situations that are, are pretty hazardous in Alaska. And that's why I'm showing the ground ice volume where you can see there's a lot of variability. But if you, you couple that with fine grained materials in a place where things are warming, um, the hills start coming apart. And in fact, it doesn't have to be much of a hill to come apart. Um, so we talk about how we're big and we're complicated, but we're also, we're kind of small too. Uh, on the left, this population, um, the 2010 census results, because I don't have one for the 2020, but it kind of shows the distribution of the population of Alaska. We have just over 730,000 people in Alaska in this gigantic area, uh, 571,000 square miles. And you do the math and it cal calculates down to a statewide population density of about 1.3 people per square mile. And the reality is, is most of those people are clumped in the Fairbanks area and in the Anchorage area and the kind of the surroundings there. So there's not a lot of people on the landscape. And on the right, we have the transportation network, the road network in Alaska. And I will emphasize that this is not a simplified road network of Alaska. This is not a road network of Alaska as seen from some amazingly zoomed out scale. If you keep zooming in and in and in and in, you're not going to see more roads. You know, this is what we've got. So the combination of sparse population and comparatively very sparse infrastructure makes it very difficult for us to compete on the national playing field for um, any sorts of hazard related research dollars. So this is a challenge that, that we face. Um, so the question then becomes, well, um, with all of this, let's focus in on landslides. So do we have landslides in Alaska? Well, USGS landslide inventory map says we have 18 of them. Um, we have 18 point entries for Alaska, the, the dots you see on the left. I will say that there are also over 15,000 um, features that were entered from the Tongass National Forest by the US Forest Service that are uh, features, debris flows made mainly that were um, taken from satellite imagery that, that have been put together into a database. But in terms of discrete significant landslides, we've got 18. If we look at the DGGS geologic map database, which we have online on our wonderful website, we can do a search on title and keyword for landslides. And the uh, little faint tiny boxes you see here and there, there's six maps that are out there that have landslide as part of its title and only 86 maps that include it as a keyword. So somewhere in there, there's a mention of a landslide. So, we don't have a lot of data. So this is a repeating theme. But even though it says we've only got 18, we do have landslides. We have a lot of landslides. Um, the landslides that make the news, um, they're in places where they intersect with people. There's a lot more landslides going on on the, the landscape that uh, we just never know about. Um, and they are many and varied. And um, I'm going to try and do a quick survey, go through some of the 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 big uh, a gallery of bad actors, as it were, to uh, show you kind of the the gamut of 
notable landslides that we, we know about on the landscape right now. And I'm gonna start here with Lituya Bay in 1958 in Southeast Alaska. Um, this is a well-known um, landslide generated uh, wave that was triggered by a, a magnitude eight earthquake on a fair weather fault. Uh, 40 million cubic yards of rock were dislodged and went into the bay and created a 1700 foot wave. And I love this graphic on the right. The internet is full of wonderful graphics and it shows what that Lituya Bay landslide or tsunami would have would look like compared to some buildings. Um, this killed two fishermen who were in a boat. And uh, this is in Southeast Alaska, if I didn't mention that before. And that was in 1958. So this is very well known. You can still see the trim lines um, on the, the slopes around the bay there. Um, 1964 Great Alaska Earthquake, also known as the uh, Good Friday Earthquake, magnitude 9.2 uh, earthquake um, in 1964. Um, Soil liquefaction was the cause of this particular Turnagain Heights uh, slope failure. Um, Bootlegger Cove formation clays, glacial marine formation was liquefied by the shaking and a strip of coastline 8,500 feet long and extending inland 900 feet uh, let loose and created a lot of damage. Moving forward, here's another earthquake. Um, in November 3rd of 2002, uh, there was an earthquake on the Denali Fault. And this was the largest strike slip earthquake in North America in 150 years. It was a magnitude 7.9. These are some landslides that were triggered by that shaking uh, and aerial recon just a few days after the event. Um, it's amazing that such a large earthquake, there were no fatalities and only one injury. And that speaks to the remoteness of where this happened. Um, this is in the Alaska range, very close to uh, um, Denali, Mount McKinley, I guess it's Denali now, but Mount McKinley National Park. Uh, let's move into the interior a little bit. Um, landslides that uh, kind of make people a little bit antsy about the economy of Alaska. This is the Yukon River. And when you say the Yukon River crossing, that's it. There is only one Yukon River crossing. There is one road that goes north over the Yukon River up to the Prudhoe Bay oil fields. This is it. This is the Dalton Highway. You see there adjacent to it is that silver gleaming pipeline of money that is full of oil from Prudhoe Bay. This single crossing is the economic lifeline of Alaska. And in fall of 2012, there was a landslide adjacent to it that really got the hair on people's necks uh, up. Um, as a result of this, there's discussion now about putting in a secondary crossing. Uh, it's still on the books. It's not become reality, but the studies are happening to try and make it so that um, Northern Alaska is not so dependent on just this one single lifeline. Um, headed down to southeast Alaska, there are a couple of them that are notable uh, in the Sitka area. This is a redoubt landslide in 2013, and you'll see that this landslide uh, kicks off and goes down into the water. And there was a lake down there with a Forest Service cabin on it that had two people who were in it when this landslide happened. Fortunately, they were able to hear what was going on and they ran and they were able to escape this landslide, so they survived. Unfortunately, their dog did not. Um, so these things are happening all over the place, but we only hear about them when there's people involved. In 2014, also near Sitka, is the Star Gavin landslide. Um, this was in an area where there were uh, watershed restoration projects taking place uh, in the aftermath of uh, historical logging. And there were actually three slides. This is the largest that was about 100 acres and it destroyed hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of restoration projects. Um, like I said, again, this is near Sitka. So Sitka is already kind of showing up as being kind of a, a, a red red glowing mark on, on Alaska for, uh, for landslides. Um, you know, I talk about, we only hear about landslides when they happen where people uh, intersect with them. Well, this one in Tom Fjord and Icy Bay, um, this one was not witnessed, but it was picked up on seismic monitoring network and then people looking at satellite imagery located this. And um, this rock slide uh, was about 200 million tons and it uh, created a local tsunami here in Icy Bay. 
an area where there are cruise ships that come through. And so um, large um, amounts of debris heading into the water where there are cruise ships is not a good idea. Um, you'll notice down here, I've put in uh, Brettwood Hig Higman from Grout Truth Trekking. If you want more information, go talk to him. Um, I am stealing information uh, blithely from across the spectrum of workers. So uh, where you see a name here in the presentation, that's where you should go to get more information. This one was in Southeast Alaska, like I said, in, in Icy Bay. Um, then in 2016, we have this one, Lomplu Glacier. And this was a snow, ice, rock avalanche that liberated about 100 million tons, went out six miles across Lomplu Glacier. It was not witnessed. Uh, it's believed to have been picked up on seismic sensors as a magnitude 2.9 seismic event. Um, and the uh, location was reported actually by a pilot flying by, actually saw this thing that hadn't been there the last time he flew by. And I want to point out again, um, down here in the lower left of this figure, that is a cruise ship. That cruise ship carries probably about 3,000 people, you know, give or take. And they go by all the time. And one can only imagine what might have happened had a landslide like this actually entered the water with a cruise ship. So these are things that are um, continuing to elevate the awareness of landslides being a problem in Alaska. Um, Gabe Wolkin at DGGS is our point of contact for this, although there were a lot of other researchers involved. But uh, go to our website, go talk to Gabe, and you can get a lot more information on this. There's uh, published uh, data out there and reports. Um, getting back to where uh, we care about slope instabilities when they uh, intersect where people are, um, this is a, a debris flow area on the Haines Highway. This is the single land connection between the community of Haines in southeast Alaska to through Canada and from there to the United States because there's no other land connections that are, are within Alaska. So you have to go through Canada to get other parts of the uh, United States, including other parts of Alaska if you're in Haines. Um, and you can see a bus passing by kind of for scale here. Um, this anecdotally, I've been told, is one of the most expensive pieces of road to maintain in all of Alaska because these pulses of material just keep coming down and coming down and coming down and coming down. Um, Gabriel Wolken and Ronald Donnan here at DGGS have been working with DOT, the Alaska Department of Transportation, trying to get a handle on what's going on in here. And um, the trigger here, or the, the, the activating factor, is what we believe at this point, is that uh, warmer climate is thawing alpine permafrost. And this is releasing material that accumulates in the source area, up in the headwaters of this basin. And then when you get a rain event that comes through, it mobilizes that material and flushes it out of the basin periodically. And so these things are happening again and again. And um, the DOT is still struggling to find out ways of how, how to handle this. So this is in Southeast Alaska near Haines. Um, this is something that is, uh, we think is related to the degradation of alpine permafrost. And since we're on permafrost now, let's talk a little bit more about permafrost because Alaska's got some permafrost features, uh, slope instability features that are, are pretty unique. So these are examples of retrogressive thaw slumps and active layer detachments um, that uh, David Swanson at the National Park Service has been studying in No Attack National Preserve in Northwest Alaska. And um, these are related to um, thawing of, of permafrost and the active layer detachments, which are shown in the bottom right figure, these are kind of, um, they, they're smaller, they're, they're a mobilization of the seasonally thawed upper layer. So every year um, in these frozen permafrost areas, when the, the weather gets warm in summer, um, there's a, a thickness of, of soil that thaws, and that's called the active layer, and that thaws and freezes and thaws and freezes annually. And this thawed layer can, um, can detach and flow. And so it moves then as a, as, a, as a flow feature across the landscape, taking the vegetation, et cetera, with it. And it's moving on top of the frozen ground. So these are, these are kind of a, a smaller scale thing. But what can happen then, though, is as frozen ground is exposed to the warm air, um, and if it's ice-rich ground and the ice melts, 
then you can start having these episodic retrogressive failure features that just kind of gnaw their way into the slope because as soon as you remove the vegetation, as soon as the active layer is removed and ice and frozen ground gets exposed to the warm air, um, things can happen pretty catastrophically. And just as a, a scale, this photograph on the left, um, the upper scarp of that retrogressive thaw slump complex is 900 feet above the river level. So that kind of gives you an idea of how, how big that is. All right. And also just now in the news again, um, this is the Pretty Rocks Landslide in Denali National Park. And Denny Capps at the National Park Service has been working on this with, with other collaborators and cooperators. Um, this road is kind of the main um, park road into all of the great wonderful features of getting deep into the into Denali Park. And in the summer, buses go by all the time carrying thousands of tourists. And this road is now closed because of this landslide feature that has been active since at least the 1960s and was probably probably there before the road was even built in the 1930s. And for decades and decades and decades, they had to do moderate maintenance every two to three years. Um, and it was just part and parcel. And, and you know, it was just had to do with the, the local setting and the slope was unstable. But probably they're thinking now in response to uh, climate drivers, um, starting in 2014, the movement on this slope increased and it increased dramatically from inches in 2014 when monitoring started, uh, inches per year. By 2018, it was inches per week. By 2019, inches per day. And in 2021, it was moving at over half an inch per hour. So this road is now closed. Um, uh, just came, got, came a notice through just in the last week that the road has dropped by 20 to 45 feet since last August. And so um, there's work underway to potentially build a bridge or somehow other way to make this happen because tourism is the lifeblood of Alaska next to oil. And uh, we need to be able to get the tourists in there to see the wonders of Denali Park. And then um, also having to do with permafrost, we have these features called frozen debris lobes. And uh, these have been recognized in the Brooks Range. In the old days, they were kind of mapped as gla uh, rock glaciers, but they are categorically not rock glaciers as research by Margaret Farrow at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and Ronald Donnan at TGGS have, have shown. These are slow moving landslides that occur in permafrost. They're composed of frozen silty sand with gravel. They are vegetated and they move on a basal shear zone and are probably hydrology driven permafrost in relations with hydrology. And these guys are really important because this picture on the left, and you can tell from the one on the right, um, that frozen debris lobe, the big one in the middle, and those with keen eyes can see several others on the slopes to the left and right. Um, that is uh, impinging, approaching in this photo, which was several years ago, the, uh, the Dalton Highway. And we remember the Dalton Highway from the Yucca River Crossing. This is the one road access to Prudhoe Bay. And right below it on the slope, you can see the cleared area where the trans Alaska pipeline system is buried in this area. Um, so these frozen debris lobes are endangering that, uh, both of those transportation and uh, oil um, networks. And the latest average rate that has been measured is about 2.6 centimeters per day on frozen debris lobe A. And because of the threat to the Dalton Highway, um, in 2018, um, the DOT went in there and they rerouted a portion of the Dalton Highway to avoid um, the, the encroaching frozen debris lobe. But they left the old highway route in there, the old uh, roadway there, and it's been instrumented by Margaret Barrow and they are now observing what's happening as frozen debris lobe A impacts that old roadbed, which has happened because as of uh, this last week, um, it is now 0.9 meters into the old roadway. And currently it's about 110 meters away from the relocated um, center line of the, the highway. So more to come on this, go to www.flaalaska.org for all sorts of wonderful information and animations and videos, and you will be highly educated and highly entertained. And I'm going to end this rogues gallery um, 
of Alaska landslides by looking at Barry Arm. I'm not going to go into detail. You've probably all heard about this Barry Arm unstable slope in Prince William Sound. Um, Dennis Daly at USGS, Gabriel Wolken and DGGS, amongst many, 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 many others, are looking into this. Um, this was originally recognized by um, uh, Brentwood Higman, Higgs' uh, sister, I believe, who was kayaking in the area, and subsequent uh, observation of satellite imagery revealed that there is this huge mass of rock on the side of Berry Arm over Berry Glacier that is moving. And there's been a lot of work now that's been uh, been done on it. You can go to the websites, you can go to the DGGS website, which hosts the Barry Arm Landslide page. But um, this is a result of glacier deep buttressing of a rock slope um, where Barry Glacier has retreated, retreated, retreated. Um, there may be warning, warming alpine permafrost at play here as well. But the big hazard here is if that rock slope releases, um, it'll send a wave into Harmon Fjord, Barry Arm, Port Wells, and on down into Prince William Sound. Lots of recreationists there, lots of ships, lots of kayakers, um, and the community of Whittier would be impacted if there were a sufficiently large wave. So now that we've looked at these, this, this gallery, I'm going to focus a little bit more on two very high-profile uh, landslides that were kind of the triggers to move the state of Alaska to get serious about starting up a landslide hazard program. The first of these was in Sitka in 2015 on August 18th. Um, there was a, a extreme weather event that occurred that triggered more than 45 known landslides um, by these heavy rains in the Sitka area. There were four debris flows that occurred in Sitka that impacted homes and infrastructure and three people perished. So this was a real big deal. This was an awakening. Um, this is the South Kramer slide. This is where the three people um, were lost. To the left of the house that's on the upper slope, you can see down trees and whatnot over here on the left. That was a house that was under construction and was being finished. And there were two workers in that home who perished. Um, one other was a building inspector who was in the area, and as this debris slide came down, this debris flow came down, he and another person attempted to flee by outrunning it and uh, climbing up on this berm that had been pushed up here as part of the construction process in this area. Um, the person in front made it. The second person was caught by the landslide and was killed. So um, this was a real traumatic event. Um, um, DGGS was contacted by the State Emergency Operations Center to come down and provide whatever technical assistance we could give as geologists um, to try and help determine uh, when or if it would be safe for rescue and retrieval activities to happen. In conjunction with this, um, we brought our photogrammetry set up and were able to fly high resolution aerial photography and develop um, ortho imagery and uh, Surface models to help model and uh, and delineate where the landslides effects were, not just of the Kramer landslides, of which there was an, another one farther north that impacted a road but didn't destroy any uh, significant infrastructure. And there are other failures around as well. Um, so we this was kind of our first deep dive into to uh, landslide response and. Um, in the aftermath of this, we worked with the State of Alaska Emergency Management Agencies to document impacts and damages. Um, one of the key things that grew out of this effort was the Sitka Geo Task Force, which was, um, it was, it ended up being organized and, and coordinated by the Sitka Sound Science Center, which is a science center located in Sitka that had personnel there on site. And it kind of organically developed as a science response group where we were able to pull knowledge, our resources and post event research and plan for the future and kind of be the point contact for any information having to do with the science end of, of things of understanding um, the safety and the hazard. And that group stayed together for, for many months coordinating the, the aftermath of the Sitka um, Kramer slides. Um, these are just to give you an idea of what that terrain is like out there working in this terrain. This is a year after in 2016. Um, 
when we've done uh, uh, sent people out to collect data and uh, understand what was going on. You can see uh, these amazing uh, curved trees. Um, there's there's thick uh, unconsolidated deposits on smooth, slick glacier scoured rock, thickly, thickly vegetated with this uh, coastal rainforest essentially. So very difficult, very unstable. Um, lots going on, difficult place to work. Um, what came out of all of this were that uh, the contributing factors were one, the recently deglaciated terrain, very steep, very characteristic of Southeast Alaska, um, that had unconsolidated material overlying bedrock. So this provided the source material to slide and move and create these, the debris flow. And there was a big weather event. And the combination of heavy rain on top of a longer term rain saturation, coupled with, they think, a significant wind shift may have caused tree toppling or tree shaking. They think that that's what triggered it. Um, but ultimately out of this, we're gaining a better understanding of what we need to know to try and, and deal with ha hazards in Southeast Alaska and Sitka in particular. and um, Coming out of this was the development uh, in its infancy, but now being um, being brought to to fruition. A landslide early warning system, the Sitka Sound Science Center, the Geotask Force, um, the the Rand Corporation, um, federal funding together has um, brought us to the point where we've got the beginnings of an early warning land uh, a landslide early warning system. Um, Part of this where DGGS is, is contributing uh, expertise and uh, capability is we installed a weather station on Harbor Mountain to help monitor the local conditions. We've done repeat LIDAR in the area, and we've also initiated um, landslide susceptibility and mapping and modeling uh, funded by, by FEMA. Excuse me here. <clears throat> So there's been a lot of work that's been going on in the aftermath of that, trying to get a handle on the hazard, where the problems are, how can we get people uh, prepared in emergency sense. And so a lot of good things have come out of this, but there's a lot of bad things that came out of it as well. As you could well imagine, when you start having landslides that kill people and destroy property, um, there's, uh, there are lawsuits. Zitka was considering code changes to add landslide zones as part of its donation as of 2017. By 2021, those landslide sections got removed from um, city code um, because of impacts to existing developments that were already on these properties that might be in landslide zones, um, what that might do to resale values, what that might do to insurability. Um, DGGS's work funded by FEMA, these debris flow hazard evaluations for Sitka. We were originally going to put it out in 2019, then it was 2020. You can see those two red circles. That particular report still has not been released as we have been working on it and reworking it to try and make revisions to make that material more palatable. And so we've been, been walking a very, very uh, unsteady um, razor's edge there. The second event I want to talk to is the Haynes 2020 uh, landslides in December 2nd. Um, this was a result of an atmospheric or river event in Southeast Alaska that actually impacted all of Southeast Alaska and ended up with a disaster declaration for all of Southeast Alaska um, by the Alaska governor. Um, there were flooding and landslides everywhere, um, countless slope failures throughout the Haynes borough, and there was one landslide in particular that destroyed four homes and Killed two people. Um, as with Sitka, DGGS was contacted by the State Emergency Operations Center to bring our geological expertise to the field to the extent that we could um, and kind of help with making some decisions about um, um, rescue and recovery. So, what we knew going in before we even got on the ground, there were some known areas of concern. Um, Tsunami inundation mapping for Skagway and Haines had identified that there was a uh, potential unstable slope across from the ferry terminal at uh, Lutac Inlet there, number two on that known areas concern map that you see on the right. 
We also knew that uh, area number three, Lutak Road, that was an area that had previously experienced slope movement because of glacier marine sediments that are in that area. And uh, um, prior um, engineering work had been done there to try and understand that. And then of course, the primary known area of concern was the beach road slide where homes were destroyed and people were missing and presumed dead. Uh, it turned out that there were actually a whole lot of other types of slope instabilities all over the area. I'm not going to go into all of those. I'm going to focus on the beach road slide just because it was so um, uh, pivotal in um, Alaska moving forward with a, a landslide hazards program. So this is the beach road slide right in the aftermath, just a few days within the, a couple of days of, of the event. Um, if you look at the uh, the photo on the left taken from the aircraft, you can see that there's the road that crossed and goes over from right to left um, and heads off into uh, extension of the subdivision. You can, oops, excuse me. You can see that there are several houses that are right adjacent to it. The one that was immediately to the right of it, which you can see in this photo on the right, that sort of a greenish house there. Um, that one actually got slightly uh, moved on its foundation by the material coming down. Um, there was reportedly a wave that was generated when this debris entered the water. Um, there was a lot of going back and forth between the EOC, DGGS, other scientists who were um, on site and on call, and the um, search and rescue uh, coordinators to try and figure out when could people get out there to start looking when for, for the missing people. I'm not going to go into all of that because that was a very complicated, complex series of actions and interaction. I'm going to try and just focus on the slide itself and what we, what we know about it scientifically. So we'll leave that stuff behind and we'll go and say, well, what do we know about the slide itself? Um, well, from the head scarp to the shoreline was a distance of 760 meters. At its widest, it was about 190 meters wide, about where it crossed the road. Um, DGGS emergency spot response staff arrived on December 4th and on December 6th as two separate groups of people coming in as we could get them in. Weather was horrible. It was, it was incredibly difficult to get people in here. Um, but by December 8th and 9th, weather was just barely good enough that we were able to fly LIDAR. We have our own um, LIDAR sensor, so we were able to uh, mount it on a helicopter and get LIDAR collected on December 8th and 9th, and we had raw products that were available on December 10th for field investigations and uh, emergency operations centers uh, decision making. Um, so you can see, you can see kind of the, uh, uh, in this raw LIDAR, you can see on the right, um, hopefully you can see my cursor, but um, the, uh, the upper scarp, the head scarp, and then, oops, um, how that, uh, that slide came down, spread out and uh, entered the water. Um, one of the things that we really early cued into is what we call the crack. Um, this is a tension crack more than 50 meters long. You can see it at the head scarp there in the photo on the bottom right. You can kind of see it tracking off. And if you just look diagonally up and left, there's another photograph that's kind of a closer up view of that. The LIDAR made that thing pop out like you wouldn't believe. And there was a lot of angst on everybody's parts, including ours, as to how much material might still be up there that could still come down if we had another weather event, um, if things just shifted and slid just enough to let that loose, if there was an earthquake, all sorts of things. And you can see in that diagram on the bottom left, um, it's just roughly a, a orange polygon put in there. Um, some of the modeling, very, very rough preliminary modeling that we were looking at indicated that if if that whole piece that we thought might be involved with this crack and its extension were to let loose, depending on how deeply seeded it were, it could head off down and impact additional homes on Beach Road beyond where the original slide um, had impacted. So there was, and if you look at that picture there in the, the center bottom, um, those red squares are each homes that uh, might potentially uh, be in the path or be uh, be in danger. So there was a lot of uh, back and forthing on that. And we had some 
ground observations as well on the upper right. You can see this is what the crack looked like as you followed its extension through the forest. You could see the ground was broken. There were roots stretched across it. Um, people reported when they were on the, uh, the downslope portion of that, that there were places that sounded hollow as they were walking. It just totally creeped everybody out. So the crack was a big issue. Um, the LIDAR also allowed us to take a look at um, where, where, we, where, material moved, where material was taken from and where it was moved to, what happened to all the material. Um, there was 2014 LIDAR product that we were able to access. It did not go all the way up to the top of the head scarp, but we were able to use, uh, use what we had, compare it to our 2020 LIDAR and do some LIDAR differencing. And what immediately becomes apparent is there was a lot of material that moved out. That's the dark green parts. They were in the central part. And there wasn't that much material deposited on land. And so the general thinking is that most of the material that got mobilized ended up out in the water and uh, contributed to that wave that I mentioned. Um, and on the right, you can see some cross sections that we, we did because there was uh, interest in trying to figure out what was the situation with the road, whether it had been taken out or is it built up or how thick, how much material do they have to deal with to reopen that road. Um, kind of in summary, you know, the uh, what 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 did we what did we kind of learn about this? Well again, you know, you're it's steep recently deglaciated terrain. And in this case, this particular slide um, started in rock and it was probably rockfall initiated, and then that mobilized unconsolidated material below it and trained that, and it all moved out. Um, again, it was weather that was the triggering mechanism. Record rainfall on top of an extended period of a lot of other rainfall and snow and rain on snow events. Um, so um, weather, weather is this, this, this repeat uh, offender that we keep coming with, up with, particularly in the south, southeast slides. So what now? Um, well, the big crack and the concerns about it and mobilizing and starting a new landslide, that was that was beyond our capacity to deal with. So uh, the DOT and Haynes community worked together to contract Landslide Technology Incorporated to assess the beach road hazards. And so they put them test pits, they've uh, installed equipment, uh, monitoring equipment. Um, the communities always also work with r &M consultants to develop um, landslide safety infographics for uh, communicating hazard and what to do. On the DGGS end of things, um, we did what we did in Sitka. We went out there and we put up a weather station. Um, because again, weather is this thing that we can look at to be kind of the, the first indicator that there might be a problem developing. What's the precipitation? Um, not just now, immediate, or in the last hour, but over the last few days. Um, we've also initiated a, a FEMA project to do landslide susceptibility maps. But the difference between this and what we did for Sitka is working with Haynes, we're only doing this mapping, we're only doing the assessment in the areas that the borough specifically wants us to assess, areas of future development and infrastructure, because we have not completely resolved the issue of what happens when we do this sort of mapping in areas where people already live. Um, it's, a, it's a gnarly problem. But where are we now? This brings us now to the, the end of this discussion or this, this talk with, uh, where's the Alaska Landslide Hazards Program right now? Well, it's a work in progress. Um, we have our marching orders, basically, because um, between Haynes and Sitka and Barry Arm, um, it became abundantly clear that Alaska needed this landslide hazard program. And so state funding was, was found to kind of initiate that. We also already had a history of being able to get money from FEMA for doing the, the FEMA mapping for um, landslide mapping for Sitka. And we'd also done some in Homer. So we knew that there was more money that could be gotten there to help support this work. And we went, marched ahead and proposed projects in Haines and Cordova that were funded. But kind of the linchpin of all of this was the National Landslide Preparedness Act, which was signed into law January 15th of 2021. And what this did is it established the National Landslide Hazards Reduction Program within the USGS. And that pulled the trigger 
on us being able to enter into a um, cooperative agreement with the U.S. Geological Survey that will hopefully be long and fruitful to provide ongoing funding to uh, assess landslide hazards throughout Alaska. So we have our marching orders at this point. So where are we going at this point? Well, here's where we are. We are working on building our staffing levels to meet the short and long-term needs of what is now going to be a long-term sustained program. And those of you who are interested in working in Alaska and looking at Alaska landslides and working with the wonderful people up here, um, this frontier area needs your help. We are recruiting for landslide hazards program manager who will develop this program and will have considerable latitude in shaping how this works, how it goes, coordinating with USGS and making it happen. And a landslide hazards geologist be working on landslide projects and particularly to kind of take ownership of the Alaska landslide inventory, which uh, uh, woefully needs to be worked on and populated. We've got programmatic ideas. We want to grow our DGGS USGS partnership and make it more formal and expand it to include the University of Alaska to get university researchers in on board with this. We have our eyes on developing a strategic plan. We need to conduct a needs assessment. We need to determine priorities. We have to develop a strategy for systematic landslide work across the state because you saw we're big, we're complicated, we're different. So we, we, need, we need a plan. And we also, you know, we have projects. We have projects coming out of our ears. Um, there is so much work to do. And it's, so, it's a really exciting time for us right now. Um, and, uh, and hopefully there's somebody out there who wants to come play with us. So I'm gonna end this now on this last slide here. And um, this is, this is the, the Haynes Beach Road slide. This is a view from the top of the headscarp, looking down the path of that landslide and, and out into the water. And I go back to this picture a lot because, you know, it's beautiful. You know, Haynes is beautiful, Alaska is beautiful. The geology is amazing, the challenges of, of work and opportunities to do, you know, really cutting edge scientific research and, and applied rubber meets the road is all right here. But this picture to me defines why we need to have a landslide hazards program because there are two people who died who are in this photo somewhere. They were never found. Um, the assumption is, is that they were carried out with the debris out into the water and um, they're probably never going to be found. But this is what we need to do this work for so we can prevent this from happening again wherever we can. So on that note, I'm going to close. I'm very hoarse from talking a lot, lots to say, but uh, questions. <laughs>